wonderful introduction song for today. I know this month here on Mysteries of the Mind, for those of you continuing to tune in after the Situation Room, that we are talking aliens this month. Now, usually on Mysteries of the Mind, it's kind of a self-guided therapy session. We utilize neuro-linguistic programming and interrogation techniques, and we talk about you and your mind. But uh, this month has been a little different and that we've been exploring alternative concepts, theories, and conspiracies of aliens among us. The last two shows, uh, the first, of course, was our Aliens 101. You can download that anytime um, and kind of get the introduction to aliens, right? <clears throat> what do I mean? The terminology, the linguistics of it. And then last week's show, we talked a little bit more in depth about what people believe are actually walking among us, alien species, and that there is more than just the one that you see in Hollywood media, and exploring your own life experiences and coincidences, which of course I do not subscribe to, that maybe you're listening to this show for a reason. Maybe you have some questions or interests about aliens and you're not exactly sure why. Well, that's is what we are talking about on the show today. And today's show is particularly special to me because I'm going to be bringing on a guest um, here in about 10 minutes um, to talk about his knowledge of government conspiracies and aliens among us. So if you're listening, tuning in from your um, tune-in app on your mobile device or if you're tuning in at intrepidradio.com, please feel free to send me any questions on social media, Facebook or Twitter, uh, or live in our chat room as we talk aliens and government conspiracy. So I'm going to delve right into it. Quote, this is a topic that receives virtually no media attention or serious consideration by the majority of people. Yet the reality of advanced extraterrestrial life is one of the most profound realizations anyone can make, and it's one we must make if we're to continue serving as the preeminent stewards of this planet without losing our freedoms as a race. And that was a quote by Phil Schneider. Um, For those of you who are interested in politics or government conspiracy or even if you're an Illuminati New World Order type person – Maybe you're unfamiliar with why I would be bringing up Phil Schneider, if that name rings a bell at all, in today's show. Well, Phil Schneider, a former government geologist and engineer, had more than 17 years of experience in black projects. He's one of the most important whistleblowers in modern history today, and Schneider, born April 23, 1947, was a metallurgist working on buildings that we refer to as DUMBS, the anagram (laughs) D-U-M-B-S. Kind of silly, right? Deep underground military bases. He spent more than 17 years of the United States government black projects carrying level 3 security clearances in secret bases, such as Area 51, S-4, Los Alamos. And he co-invented methods used in shape charge explosive research to facilitate the building of these underground military bases, as well as submarine bases currently used today. He claims to be one of the only three survivors of the now infamous alien-human war at the Dulce, New Mexico, Los Alamos underground base, where 66 government agents and workers lost their lives in August 1979. Now, he does presentations at Preparedness Expo all over the world. He traveled around and spoke frequently on his experiences with deep underground military bases, However, in his presentation at the Preparedness Expo in September of 1995, he exposed the gravity of the New World Order agenda and its connection with extraterrestrials in a direct and very controversial manner. He dropped the political correct way in which he spoke about his life experiences. And less than six months after giving this talk, was found dead in his apartment, strangled to death with piano wire still wrapped around his neck, and what appears to be military-style execution. But according to sources... He had been brutally tortured repeatedly before being killed. Authorities dismissed the death as a suicide. His family has never given up the relentless legacy of what he spoke about. And Phil Schneider um, is one of those individuals who was brave enough to do exactly what Rocky Stucci was telling us to do in the previous show, The Situation Room, which is to use your voice. If you're someone who 
doesn't necessarily like to just turn on the TV and watch the Kardashians, but you're more interested in your politics, you're interested in what's going on today, you're interested in Agenda 21, you're interested in the Constitution and your rights, you're interested in the changes that are happening in and around us every day, all day, today, yesterday, tomorrow, then I encourage you to continue listening to today's show because we're going to be bringing on a military veteran and he's going to be talking about some of his experiences. But before, I just want to mention again, deep underground military bases. Um, it sounds kind of crazy, right? What in the world could I be talking about? Well, there are many of these bases worldwide, but just a small list. Dulce in New Mexico, Brecon Beacons in Wales, Los Alamos in Mexico, the Pine Gap in Australia, the Snowy Mountains in Australia, the Nilo Range in Africa, west of Kandu in Africa, next to the Libyan border in Egypt, Mount Blanc in Switzerland, Neverk in Scandinavia, Gotland Island in Sweden, and many, many, many more. Some would even say the Denver International Airport, but that's a whole other radio show. But these projects are being run by secret, unelected international governing bodies connected to the UN. If you're interested in such things as the dumb, steep underground military bases, I encourage you to look into Project Pluto. Google that in your own time or tune in here on future shows. But there are at least 1,400 of these dumbs worldwide that have been illuminated by whistleblowers, 131 in the United States alone, with two underground bases being built per year in the United States at this moment with our tax dollars. The average depth of the base is up to four and a quarter miles deep underground, some more shallow and some more deep. But today's concept, and why am I mentioning this as we're talking about aliens, is I want you to think about, for a moment, a brief moment, <laughs> popular media, movies like Taken, 1954, Griotta Treaty of Eisenhower. What in the world is that? Have you ever heard of that treaty? Well, for those of you who are interested, email me. I can provide for you a paper that explores the evidence of a first contact meeting occurred in 1954 with extraterrestrials with distinctive Nordic appearances like we had discussed in last week's show. The likelihood of an agreement having been spurred from the Nordic race starting a series of meetings that led to the treaty eventually being signed with a different extraterrestrial race, the Greys. This sounds crazy, right? Dwight Eisenhower, the Greta Treaty, 1954. I mean, what is this? Well, recent reports through MUFON and for those individuals who contact me frequently for alien abduction, regression, extreme hauntings, and parapsychological topics have talked further about the Greta Treaty of Eisenhower. And perhaps today in some of our questioning of our guest, we'll further examine why these events were kept secret for so long, the significance of the 50th anniversary of this meeting, and whether an official disclosure announcement is ever likely to be released in the near future why the United States keeps its X-Files hidden. So, 10% of the world's population believes they've been abducted. We covered that in the previous weeks. And those are just the people willing to speak out and be brave. Many believing that they have been operated on with sexual undertones. As of 2014, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, 800,000 children are reported missing each year. It's roughly 2,000 children per day. Of those, there are 115 child stranger abduction cases each year, meaning the child was taken by someone unknown. There are individuals in the parapsychological realm, such as Dr. David Jacobs, PhD, who's talked about unprecedented events happening in and around us, and that abductions are very real, mostly an integration program with hybrids and the collateral of our children. MUFON and many other independent organizations believe that aliens could in fact be taking children, but for what reason? And the following is just one of the estimated 200,000 missing children a year abducted via a MUFON report. He began to tell me that in his dreams, he woke up and a little gray man would take him. It would take him out the door and look at him and then take him up on his ship. The gray men had big black eyes. And when I asked about the nose, he would push his small nose up and into his face. I'm thinking to make it look like there wasn't much of one there. I asked him about their hands. He said their fingers looked like long, pale sticks. He said the ship was silver with yellow, green, and white lights. He said it was a ball with a ring around it. It was beautiful. 
He said that they would take him to the moon. He told me they were talking in whispers, and he remembered them telling him to stay, stay with us. He kept repeating that. He said he was scared. He told them many times to take him home to mommy. I remember him telling me this story. Well, this mother is still searching for her lost son today. One morning, he simply was not in bed. And she turned to some of the organizations online to later find out that she was one of thousands. Parents, confused and lost, searching for their missing child. And of course, the t- statistics are, are pretty staggering. For me as a, a mom myself, um, it's pretty scary to think about. So sometimes you hear these statistics, you hear these stories, you don't necessarily have a name or a face to apply it to. You have people like uh, Phil Schneider who are no longer with us because they spoke out with their cause. Um, But there are many, many, many brave people telling their stories and who work in gray areas. And so without further ado, we are going to cut to a break. And when we return, we are going to be welcoming one of my dearest friends, Jody Cook. He's one of the most active Bigfoot researchers in the state of Ohio, and he's absolutely been everywhere. You've probably seen him on TV. Um, Author of Bigfoot Encounters in Ohio, Quest for the Grass Man, as well as Bigfoot Encounters in Ohio. He founded the Ohio Center for Bigfoot Studies. He's a member of the American Bigfoot Society. He's appeared on several television programs, and he discusses a number of crazy things um, featured on shows like History Channel's Monster Quest. Um, But we're going to be bringing him online here after the break to talk about aliens, his military service, and what he might think of government X-Files and what they are not telling us. So for those of you listening, tune in here after the break with Mysteries of the Mind. to Mysteries of the Mind with me, your host, Sarah Soderlund. And for those of you who listened to the first 10 minutes, the introduction of today's show, you know that we're talking very dangerous, spooky, scary stuff with our Alien series. But more importantly, today with our very special 
guest, Mr. Jody Cook, who's going to be taking us a little deeper into the realms of talking about aliens and government conspiracies and, and whatnot. So I gave him an introduction before the break, but Jody, are you with us? Yes, I am. Woo! I'm so excited. So Jody is such a dear friend to me, and he's kind of one of those guys that we don't get to see each other very often because we don't live in the same state or even the same time zone, but um, I'm always kind of secretly trolling his page and watching what he's up to, and I'm a big fan of his books and seeing him on television when he's uh, prancing around on Monster Quest talking about monstery things, but um, he's such an important um, piece of information, at least for me, because like I had mentioned before the break, sometimes you hear these stories, you know, and you hear these tales, but you don't have an actual name or a face to apply to that story. And so you kind of, you know, that skeptical part of you is like, ah, well, you know, <coughs> probably just something crazy. And I think it's a, dis- a defense mechanism too. You try and kind of push it under your skin and just say, you know, that's probably not real. But Jody and I have sat next to the campfire uh, at a few different conventions late at night when everyone else goes to sleep. And we've told some pretty crazy stories between the two of us that, for me, um, it kind of brings some of those implantations, those denials, and those things that you try and bury deep, deep down inside to the surface. And it's both scary, but it's also refreshing because, and since you know you're not alone, but also you have this kind of informant, if you will, this person who is a knowledgeable, educated, experienced person, and they're telling you these stories. And it's it's a little empowering to know that you're not alone. So, Jody, I had introduced you before the break as, of course, an author, someone who's very, very big in the cryptozoology field, someone who's established and um, been a historian and, and written many, many things about Bigfoot, and that's, of course, a big part of who you are, but um, could you share with us also, I know that you're a veteran, and I know that you're a father, Mm -hmm. and uh, if you could, just kind of give us a brief intro. Who is Jody Cook? Oh, God. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I'm a a veteran, spent uh, 20 years in the Army, uh, served in Iraq, Um, you know, and in my military service, there, there's there's some odd stuff that um, I kind of came across and and things um, that I, I couldn't question, you know. Um, and I, I can talk a little bit more about that, you know, later in the show. Um, you know, but you know, uh, definitely into you know UFOs and stuff. Uh, I did that for years before I got into cryptozoology, and you know, just recently, um, you know, Bigfoot was my prime prime research and then I started recently get into the dog man stuff and um, wrote uh, three books dealing on that subject and I got a really good story about that that kind of falls into the realm what you're what we're going to be talking about tonight mm-hmm. and things um, but yeah yeah you know uh, it, it's been a big part of my life for, for a long time and and things and you know me I go to paranormal conventions I go to you know, uh, paranormal investigations. Cause you know, I like to, you know, get caught up in, you know, with everything and be a part of everything right. and things. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun. I, you know, I, I really love it. Yeah. Well, and you're, you're someone who's not just one of those, um, paranormal convention junkies, you know, typically you've, you've got uh, a spectrum of individuals who go to these kind of events, but when you see someone like Jody Cook, he's this man in the back, um, with his army getup and his table all adorned with skulls and books and uh, just really crazy archaeological things that either you're drawn to or you're scared of, which for me, I was always kind of drawn to that. And of course, reading your books and your stories, one of the coolest things for those who may not be, um, who may not be familiar with your Bigfoot stories is it actually closely coincides with you serving in the military. Yeah. And, um, I think it's your Grassman book was the first one that I read in that series where it talks about, you know, when you're in the army, you don't want to talk about that kind of thing because it might be degrading to your reputation. It might, you know, be a little defamation to mental character and you don't just walk off and say, hey, guys, I just saw Bigfoot, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, there there was um, the, the, the base that we were at 
um, has had multiple, multiple sightings on that post. Um, UFO sightings, you know, was nothing out of the ordinary, um, you know, on, on that particular post. And, you know, when I had my sighting, um, you know, thank God there was, you know, three other guys with me. And, you know, just prior, about a week or so prior to, you know, my sighting, a couple um, officers had a sighting, you know, and um, I, I remember them getting a lot of grief for reporting it, you right. know. So, you know, we had our sighting, you know, we were going from point A to point B, it was getting late, and we decided to go off road, which on a military uh, reservation, you're, that's a no no, but we did it anyhow. Um, and the tree line was getting very thick. We were in um, <clears throat> one of the old four Broncos at the time because uh, they still use some of those as like service vehicles and things. And, um, I, you know, as the tree line was getting very thick, you know, the vehicle couldn't pass through. So we were saying we're going to go ahead and, and back the vehicle up and go back on the, you know, the main road. And that's when it moved. And, you know, he blent in with the environment so well, you know, we didn't even notice him being there. And at, at first, we kind of thought it was a tree going to hit the vehicle because he was so big. Wow. And, we, you know, we realized it, you know, it, it you know, wasn't a tree. It was a Bigfoot. And, um, you know, to this day, I mean, the, just the detail is just like burnt in. Uh, you know, this thing was probably, you know, seven seven and a half feet the the hair you know was like a reddish brown color and you know like on top of his head on his chest and kind of like on the upper part of his shoulders and stuff uh there weren't too much hair there it was kind of looking like how a dog or a raccoon or something with mange that okay. was kind of that was kind of what it looked like um but extremely muscular i mean extremely muscular uh, very, very human face, uh, human nose, you know, massive jaw, had the satural crust on the top of the head, you know, um, you know, thick brow. Um, the eyes were like a, a, a black red color, you know, and um, no, no white whatsoever, you know, in the eyes and, you know, long arms, long fingers, long legs, but, you know, extremely muscular and made eye contact with it. And as it was moving, like if you're looking forward, he was moving from left to right. And the whole time he watched us and the movement was almost like a, a slide, you know, and, and things, you know, humans bounce when they walk that he was just, right. perfect. you know, he was just perfect. And to, he got out of, um, you know, view and, you know, we didn't say anything to each other. You know, we were just like in awe. And, you know, as we were getting back, you know, we, you know, got to the Katoma area and we just, you know, we're like, you know, we're not going to say nothing. And I never said anything for like 15 years until I wrote Traces of the Grass Man. And then I, I talk about the experience in that book. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it was just something I was, you know, I, I held for, for, I mean, the only person I ever can find that story into was Linda Moulton Howe. Um, a few years after it happened, I got a chance to talk to her and, and stuff. And I told her, of, you know, told her of the story and things. And I know she mentioned it um, when she did an interview with Art Bell, you know, which was kind of neat, which, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, 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 it was, it, it, it was, it was a nice, it was a nice sighting. <coughs> Excuse me. But no, like I said, well, I remember reading um, Traces of the Grass Man and you really describing it quite well. Mm -hmm. But it also seems like it was something, you know, for you and your two other friends being out on this excursion. And, and you're military veterans. You're, you're soldiers who, you know, have fought overseas. You've seen some pretty mm -hmm. traumatizing things. Yeah. Been through some crazy yeah. stuff. And it had to have been a scary yeah, you know, actually it wasn't. Um, and, and people ask me about that. Um it was more awe. I mean, you were just so caught up and fascinated with what you saw. There was no fear. I don't even remember a smell, you know, and that, that's, that's the biggest thing, you know, because uh, I've been in the field enough times where I would smell something that's there, you know, and then I would have like a tree branch or a rock or, or sticks or something thrown at me. You know, so I know, so I, I, I kind of familiar with the smell, but that day, you know, um, there was there was no smell, 
you know, and there was no fair until like afterwards, you know, uh, cause it was just, you're, you're, you had the pleasure, I, I think of seeing something you'll never, ever see in your lifetime again. And you got, you got the chance to see it and, you know, didn't take the eyes off or anything like that. It's, it's just, you know, <laughs> I know the one private behind me, you know, was freaking out. I do know about that because it, it totally scared him to death. Yeah, it would Did scare I, me. I think I'd be peeing my pants. Yeah. Well, I, I, he, he, you know, we had our weapons with us. Um, and I know he was, he was searching and, and, you know, for like a magazine to put in his uh, weapon. And, you know, we obviously didn't have ammunition, you know, on us. But he was that scared, you know, you know, when he seen it. But the rest of us, you know, we were, you know, all seniors, you know, NCOs and stuff. And it's it's like, you know, <laughs> wow, you know, this right. is, you know, this this was this was neat. But like I said, it was nothing new at that post. Now, you know, we sat there and talked with soldiers from time to time who have seen things, you know, where they, you know, I mean, I remember quite a few times being so far back in the training area where the roads were, you know, sand and you would see the footprints where this thing would walk in the road. And, and you know, we, you see them and you don't think anything of it because, um, you know, uh, you, you know what's there. And, and because everybody knew that there was something there at night was when you felt the fear and when you're on guard duty and everybody else is asleep and you're out in this air, you know, you're a little bit further away from, you know, everybody else because you're, you're sitting in a listening post doing guard duty and you're by yourself. And that, that, that's scary because you hear everything, you know, and you hear the grunts and sounds, you know, the moans and stuff like that. And, you know, where it look, it's like something's, you know, kind of surrounding you, tracking you mm. and stuff. And that's where you, you get, you know, you, your, your fright steps in. But, I, you know, if this thing wanted to hurt us, he would have done it. He could have right. done it, but he didn't. But like you said, this particular post, I mean, it, it was it was nothing for like, you know, UFO sightings and stuff. I mean, we were. Um, well, then, so I have to ask, because mm -hmm. so frequently, especially in like cryptozoology, for those listening. In that may not be familiar with things like um, Dogman, Mothman, if you want to couple that in there, Bigfoot, and UFO sightings, and Men in Black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think that there's a correlation? Do you think that I, there is something going on with military bases? And I mean, because UFOs, obviously unidentified flying objects, that could be something that the military has. Well, right, because here, here's the thing. The, the former... CEO of Boeing said, everything you see on Star Trek exists today. And this, this, is, this was straight from the, you know, the, the, the CEO that makes all the military aircraft, you know, for the country, for the military. He actually said that, you know, so if, if, if he says, you know, whatever you see on Star Trek exists, it exists. Ah. Okay. And, 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 you know, he had no quarrel on saying that, you know, so I honestly believe, you know, at least 80 percent, maybe 90 percent of UFOs seen are, you know, top, top secret military aircraft. You know, there's rumor, you know, that the triangle um, UFOs, you know, they're, they're U.S. military and that we actually have a fleet um of highly advanced crafts that protects the earth, you know, uh, from, you know, any type of hostile alien invasion, you know, that, that may occur, you know, um, and, and there's a lot of rumor about that. And, so do and you, so, well then, so I have to ask, do you believe in aliens? I, 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 I do. I, 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 you know, the, the thing of it is it, they have to be another, they have to be more an intelligent species out there than mankind, okay? <laughs> you know, and, and that's the way, you know, I look at it. They have to be something else out there. If, if, if God created us, then he had to create someone else. Now, my personal opinion and my belief, I believe that we came from Mars, that Mars, you know, was a habited planet that, you know, that killed itself through war and whatever 
people are left were able to go to Earth, and that's where we we came from. And 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 I believe that, you know, because there's so much stuff on Mars proving that there was a civilization, and that there was possibly a nuclear, you know, um, battle on that planet, you know, because of the amount of radiation and the way that you know some of the you know, collation of the rocks and things, you know, and, and, you know, but like I said, that, that's my belief, you know, and, um, and to I bring like, this up. Well, no, I'll keep going. I'm sorry. I, I just, I love that. Yeah. I, I love that well, concept because there's a lot of people who would agree with you. Well, you know, because I, I remember talking to this kid, I mean, this little kid, we were talking about this at a convention. He goes, do you think, um, cause you know, he loved Richard Hoagland. And I mean, this kid was probably, you know, t- 10 years old and this kid was, you know, knew all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm, I'm getting blown away with this kid. And he goes, you know, uh, do you think that, you know, before they came to earth, that they were the ones that killed the dinosaurs off, which would have been the main predators of humanity starting on earth, you know? And it, I mean, that kind of made sense, you know, right. and, and thanks, you know, kill, kill, you know, you got to kill the predators off before, you know, we, we get here. But, you know, who's to say, I mean, sooner or later, you know, we're going to we're going to know that there's something out there. I mean, I, I, I truly believe our government knows, you know, but they our government feels that, you know, we can't take the truth, you know, and I don't think it's going to destroy humanity because, you know, look, the president could get on TV right now, you know, or the pope, you know, can get on TV and say, listen, extraterrestrials exist. You know, we, we, we have bodies, we got down crafts, you know, we're being visited. But so far, you know, they haven't, you know, created any type of problem or showed any threat. But if they do, you know, we'll be able to handle the situation. Well, you know what? Everybody in their mind already knows they exist. So, you know, you're still going to get up tomorrow morning. You're still going to go to work. You got something to talk about at work, you know, for a little bit. You're still going to go out to dinner with your, you know, family. You're still going to take your kid to soccer practice. You're still going to go to the movie. Your life's not going to stop because deep down inside, you already knew that aliens exist. I mean, it's it's part of our culture, you know. Right. It, it's it, I mean, you know, we're, we're so bombarded with so many different movies and things about aliens and stuff. So, I mean, and, and, and the normal person knows that, you know, we can't be the only species. My fear is that the human species is a very violent race of people. This, I, I, our, our country, our, our world has never seen a period of peace. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? There's, right. uh, there's always some type, some type of conflict going on, you know, and, and, you know, if they're observing us, you know, maybe they don't want to make contact because they know we're a violent race or sooner or later, they're going to be a violent race out there. That's going to want to come and pick a fight. I mean, you know, and, and so you, you've got to pre- be prepared for this, you know, for this to happen, you know, sooner or later, it's going to happen. You know, um, I just hope it's not to the point where it's like, you know, um, independence day and more like, uh, uh, Battle of Los Angeles, where we're going up against right. any ways that we can compete with on, you know, compete with on the field, you know, right. battle, you know, and that's what I liked about that movie so much was that we were able to compete with them in the field of battle, but they still had technology, you right. know, and things. But I mean, if you think about it, you know, look at the resources. You know, we have a lot of minerals, and 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 the, the, here's some odd things. I mean, you know, when we're mining gold, you know, and silver. We knew when we first started doing that, somebody was here first mining it before we were, you know, so and, and you know, it's a mineral. I think I think, it, you know, everybody wants. So it's funny because you're mentioning so many things that we've talked about this month so far in our alien series where you mentioned the importance of how this unconscious knowing that aliens already exist among us and how Mm -hmm. in almost every culture, whether it's Egyptian or Mesopotamia or, you know, glyphs all over the world, the Mayans, these mentioning of an alien race, um, or even, uh, Scotty Roberts who might, you know, want to go into the Nephilim and the watchers and the Gregory and the books banned from the Bibles and, and the things that people are finding and that we're digging up and the, you know, uh, 
the giants, the, 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 the things that put their foot into the cryptozoological realm because we've not exactly got all the details yet. And some people want to push that away and say, no, nah, that's crazy. And the other people are saying, no, 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 it's, it's possible and it's real. We're just trying to put the pieces together. And then you also had mentioned, um, for those not familiar with, with um, Richard Hoagland, uh, he's a huge guy with the faces, the faces of Mars and the going to launching of the Mars and kind of a scientific genius. And my husband's a big fan of him, actually. And he probably shares that same belief with you that mm-hmm. we've been there before. Um, last week we talked about Project Pegasus and some of the conspiracy theories that we already are there. Um, that we already have bases there, and we're just not publicly telling anybody. But then kind of one of the questions I had for you, because this is kind of out there for for most people, but I'm wondering if it's out there for you. Um, we had mentioned the 1954 Griotta Treaty with President Eisenhower and this very uh, blip in – public relations that's kind of been covered up since, that he has had this first contact with extraterrestrials. Uh, You've got Roswell happening at this time. You've got all of these uh, government projects happening and kind of this contact of aliens and that now we have this big burst in technology, right? And that the government clearly knows and has worked with and is talking with and might even have treaties with alien species and are they walking among us and if so what do they want well see a part of that whole thing with with um you know eisenhower you know having treaties with alien species you know one of them was that the nordics you know offered you know the 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 rumor okay let me put it that way the nordics offered you know, everything to us if we would get rid of nuclear weapons. And, you know, he said, no. I mean, this is our defense against another hostile species like yourself or if the another hostile species gets involved with our enemies. We have to have something to protect us. And, you know, the Nordics said they didn't want nothing to do with us after that. You know, but I I truly believe that Nordics are walking among us. Um, I don't think men in black are aliens. I think that, you know, they're uh, mechanical, like, like data's, you okay. know, from Star, from, you know, Star Trek. Yeah. I think that's what, you know, because different stories that I've heard from people who are actually in contact with them, you know, and that's how they describe them. They're more machine, you know, like an artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah, like an artificial intelligence. And, you know, I, I truly believe that our our government, you know, has things that are so far advanced that the, the people don't need to know. Okay? And, and, and being in the military, you have to understand when I'm, where, where I'm coming from. If it's for the protection of our planet and we've got something, you don't need to know about it until the time has come. Right. Okay? Because, you know, um, that secrecy it, is important. It, it, is the important. secrecy secrecy is important as well as you know not not have answering questions on how we got it and why we got it. You, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, and, and, and and you know and and you know very, long as it's not used on the American people, that's fine. If we got bases on the moon, we got bases on Mars, which I believe that they're there. That's fine. You know, let them be there. You know, as long as it protects us from being eaten or slaved or whatever, you know, so be it. We don't need to know about it. Let us go ahead with our own life. But but like I said, you know, it comes down to this. You know, if the you know government says, hey, you know, they do exist, blah, 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 that's fine. We, but we're still going to be angry with them because they lied to us. And if they, you know, they tell us that they can protect us. Well, how do we know they can protect us if they kept the information from us? Right. You know, and, and the thing of what the American people need to understand, you know, the military is going to protect government interests, interests and, and high key government personnel only. And the heck with the rest of the, you know, civilian population. The movie World War Z was a perfect example of it. Only key personnel was saved. Everybody else, you're on your own. 
right. you know, and, and, right. you know, and, 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 and that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, people think that, you know, the government's going to come in and, and say, OK, here's a bunch of guns and ammunition, protect your town. No, it doesn't work that way. Every single piece of resource is going to go towards the military. You know, you are on your own, you know, if anything happens, you know. Well, it's, I know, I know the that same. our producer is loving to hear that because on a lot of the shows that were on Intrepid, they talk about political right. And just even in our country with it, like things like Agenda 21 and things like disarming the public and, and you know, how aware are you and how proactive are you in taking care of yourself? Taking care of yourself. And, exactly. And that's the thing most people aren't. You know, that that's the whole purpose, like the, why the military, okay, under the Constitution, cannot remove the President of the United States. Okay? And, and, and the reason why that's there is the, the military to protect the government interests. You know, the Constitution, you know, is the people. Okay? That's the Constitution. Well, you know, when, when, when all hell breaks loose, the Constitution doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Right. It, it, it's, it's for the government and the government only. You know, and that's why the American people have to, you know, have to, you know, protect yourself. You know, the government can sit there and talk all they want about taking guns away from the people. It's not going to happen. It will never happen. You know, um, it, you know, it would be it would be an absolute bloodbath before it, it ever took place because nobody's going to give up their, you know, their rights. And, and you know, the United States military is not going to do it. So he's going to have to use an outside you know, resources to do it, you know, so the people, I, they, I think we're pretty well protected there. I mean, you know, Barack Obama can do all this, his false flag gun shootings that he wants, but you know, it's, it's not going to stop anything, you oh, know, that's um, such, that's just such but, a whole nother radio show. I would love to have, I think I always say that <laughs> have you on. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's like, that's a whole nother yeah. radio show that I want to talk about. Well, do you think, yeah. Because uh, you had mentioned a few things in there that I think is important for people to understand. Because you, of course, being someone who served 20-plus years in the military, mm -hmm. this is coming from someone who's – you're not just a crazy conspir conspiracy guy. That you're someone who's saying, no, you know, this is important. It's important that you, you know, fight for your well-being. So – and that it's also important that the government – maintain secrecy on certain things, whether it's the X-Files or treaties with alien races or what have you. What A question I want to ask before we run out of time, because we've got 15 minutes here, and I want to talk about this, and I want to talk about Dogman. And so quickly, I want mm -hmm. you to let me know what you think. I had mentioned to the listeners about deep underground military bases, or DUMS, and these locations all over the world, um, all over the United States. And the theory, the conspiracy theory, if you will, um, that is a part of some of these alien treaties, that there has actually been um, an agreement made that it's okay, the, the government is not going to be pursuing investigations on missing children, and that there's, there's like 2,000 children a day go missing. And the possibility mm -hmm. that um, maybe they could be utilizing these deep underground bases or are these deep underground bases just for political upper echelon and nuclear war or what are they? Do they exist? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you, the, you know, the whole thing with, with missing children, um, I think that I don't I don't think that aliens are taking our children. I, I think that our children are being taken for you know, the, um, uh, underground, um, I would say, you know, substance. human trafficking, right. human, human trafficking, trafficking. Right, you right. know, and stuff, um, and things, maybe, you know, they, they might be taking the children, maybe our government's taking the children to indoctrinate them to, um, you know, to, for when they get older. You know, it's one of these things, you know, where, you know, some, you know, where someone could be, you know, abducted and, you know, they're taken in time, you know, to protect the planet and then brought back, you know, when they reach a certain age type thing. I mean, I've heard stories about that um, as as far as underground stuff go. I, I know in, you know, the 1950s, the Army Corps of Engineers, along with a lot of the different agencies, you know, looked at the um about 
going underground in case of a nuclear war. And I know facilities were made underground. Um, you know, Mammoth Cave was one of the you know places they talked about because it goes from uh, Kentucky down to you know Mexico, um, and it was made for you know the sole purpose of putting as much civilian population down there to survive to repopulate after a nuclear war. So I, there's documents proving that it had nothing to do with aliens or anything like that. But you know, I, I think that you know when the government starts working on the project. They have different ideals, what they, they want to go with, and said the ideal what it's supposed to be. Now, give you a really good, interesting story. Ooh. When Katrina happened, when when Katrina happened, um, I talked to quite a few people who um, I was in the military with that was down there, and you know they said you know for one, don't think for one minute that the reason why they took guns away from people down there was because of looting and, and things, he said they had an extremely large problem with reptilian beings that were living underground and they were coming up because they were being flooded out. And that was the sole purpose of the weapons being taken away because God forbid a civilian kills one of them and it shows up on the news. Well, and that's why they ran... That's why they violated the Constitution. So do you believe that like Blackwater and situations with the Katrina relief was related to reptilian extraction? Because that's not just a conspiracy exactly. theory. That's a big, that's a that's, big that, conspiracy I, theory. Do you think that's real? Yeah, I, I talked. Oh, yeah. I talked to guys from Blackwater in the military that, that I mean, different parts of the country that I talked to that that's confirmed that. You know, they said that these things, they, this, this one particular friend of mine told me that these when when they would go out on patrol looking for them when they came in contact with one these things were able to make them freeze in their boots until they were able to get out of the area he literally freeze you know make 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 the soldiers stand there and not be able to be mobile until it was able to get away he said that is what these things are doing they didn't kill any they didn't kill any of us they were the, the military main thing was to Relocate them. Wow! Out of the out of, out of the civilian population, and you know, and, and I've heard this from quite a few different people from different parts of the country that had no contact with with each other. You know, so uh, that there, yeah, that's that's something, and that's something big because <laughs> I, 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 that's something. I, no, yeah, because I, I totally believe in like the hollow earth theory that, and you know, there's no big core burning in the middle of the earth that there's another civilization there and there's so much proof that there the possibility exists because of what hitler did what you know the united states military did by looking for these things and i think that's where we get all these different cryptids you know the mothman dogman you know bigfoot you know all these other cryptids that they're coming out from underground you know and things it, it it makes to me it makes perfectly sense, and and that you know these reptilians, you know, um, are you know species that you know that's been here, you know, it, it's the whole thing that you know if dinosaurs evolved, you know, didn't die off and evolved, they would become a species like man, where they're but still reptilian, where they're on you know two legs, you know. Um, there, there's a really good article about that. Um, I was reading that actually said that if, if like the velociraptor would have evolved, it would eventually came into like a human style species, but still reptilian. And maybe these, what these reptilians are, you know, were, you know, dinosaurs at one time that, you know, just through time they, they, um, uh, evolved, you know, there, there's a lot of theory behind that. Mm, it's so crazy. But, now. Uh, mm -hmm. For those listening, I mean, we could just go on for days and days and days about some you, of these. You need to have a two-hour show. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. But one of the things you, like you had mentioned early on, that you are doing work on, that you've written books on, that is not one of the more common cryptids is Dogman. And you said that it kind of links with the topic of aliens and government conspiracy. Right. And so I want to hear right. that. Okay. Um, I was at a convention. Actually, it was at the convention that you were at with your husband 
uh, at Mid South. Oh, okay, yeah. Remember, yeah. And, and and I gave you that Richard Hoagland book. Yeah, it yeah. Was at, that, it was at that very convention that, um, and you know where the bar restaurant was right there. Yep, um, the and, and the hotel. I was in there, and there was a gentleman sitting in there. He was he was military because yeah, you, know, you can always look at someone and tell they're military. So I was at the bar, and we were talking. We were asking what was going on. I told him about the paranormal conference and stuff, and you know, and he asked me, you know, you into ghost hunting? No, I, you know, I do the Bigfoot and the Dogman stuff. And he kind of like had this look on his face, Dogman. And I kind of explained to him. He goes, you know, um, let me tell you a story. And, and a little bit prior to that, we were talking about military because we both, you know, mentioned that we were in the military. And he goes, he was with the Special Operations Unit. Um, back in the 80s and uh, he said that there was a facility in South America in a particular country that we have contact with um, that had some of these dog bin species in this facility and they, 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 that they were so dangerous they would not keep them in the United States that's why they kept them in this other facility in South America and he said that they are very dog looking, you know, werewolf looking high ears. You know, he said they look just like a dog. You know, your typical Van Helsen style werewolf. But he said they were an alien species, a very violent alien species where they wore armor. And that the specific Pacific um you know group got was able to get out of the facility and went into a local village and was just killing everybody in this local village. So they had to go and find them and kill them off. And he said that they were, they had to use a special weapon in order to do it, to kill them because of their armor, you know. And uh, he said when they would kill them, they, it, they made this God awful sound. He said it, it, uh, he'll be dreaming at night and hear that sound and it would wake him up. And he said he would he would be shaking and, you know, and, and this is what this guy's telling me, you know. So I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there going, yeah, crazy. yeah, you know, and stuff. So I was at a convention about a year later, and I was talking with Linda Goffrey, who was the author of Beast of Bray Road. And I told her the story. She looked at me. She goes, Jody, I, I heard the same story from a different person. The same exact story. And it wasn't from the same guy. You know, because I described the guy who told me, and she goes, no, this guy was different. It's, he had, you know, he had dark hair. This guy was blonde, you know, and, but she heard the same exact story. So I'm like thinking, man, you know, that's, <laughs> that's scary. It is you know, scary. That, well, and that, you know. Well, and I think of things like Egyptian theology, where you've got the Anubis type figure, mm-hmm. this dog figure that in later popular media, which I do agree with you that sometimes these things come out in science fiction. It's almost to kind of uh, soothe us in a way and get us familiarized with certain things so we don't have this kind of you know reaction. So it's like an integration, if you will. And when you see the movie um, yeah. Stargate and these Anubis creatures, mm-hmm. are, it's an armor. And and so I love that concept right. of this cryptid species that's well, using a form of armor. Because well, why not? Well, King, yeah, King Lycan in um, the um, um, oh god, give me a second here, and I'll um, uh, in the Greek mythology, King Lycan was one of these dog dog men that wore armor. You know, oh, uh, love that the bike. The Vikings even talk about the dog warriors. I, I wrote a, I wrote a really good book called Werewolves, Myths, and Legends, and I talk about all this stuff in there. Like I said, the Vikings even having, you know, um, like the Thirteenth Warrior and the Viper. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, that that was a dog, like you know, a dog that wore armor. You know, so I mean, throughout history, we all know this: the Egyptian history and things, and um, and, and you know. But King Lycan was not, not a violent individual, but he was able to be firm, but fair. But you know, you crossed him, he, you know, he, he would kill you because the rumor is that you know this guy always co- you know carried an axe with him, you know, or, you know, type you know type weapon, you know. But Greek. Greek mythology talks so much, you know, about, um, uh, you know, these dogmen 
and you know there's um the 15th century um there there was um a, a battle called uh werewolf in battle you know where these dogmen you know were fighting knights same thing they were wearing armor and this was you know in in the 15th century um because there's actually a wood cut that you know that shows one of these dogmen warriors killing a knight well when you just you, know, you think of the long history in, in american culture of of the lichen and the werewolf concept i mean it's it's mm-hmm. it's oh, i just love it i just love it and and so here we are for those of you listening we're we're talking with Jody Cook that's J O E D Y Cook and if you just go to amazon dot com and put in Jody Cook you're going to find a slew a plethora a gaggle of books everything from dogman werewolf encounters in northern america to oh legends of the grassman traces of the grassman my first one that i read by you um but um they're just everything from mothman to werewolves to dogmen to winged entities to to zombies and I think that you're a wonderful, wonderful person to have in my black book of go-to. You just are such um, a wealth of knowledge. So for those of you who want to be of the special and um, to touch base with Jody Cook in person, I believe you had mentioned that your next upcoming convention is ShadowCon. ShadowCon. Uh, ShadowCon in Indiana. For those of you in the Midwest, check that out. It's October 18th. Uh, and 19th, so it's just a few weeks away here. But um, check Jody out. I'm going to be linking to him on my social sites, Facebook and Twitter. Um, buy the books, man. Check him out. And for sure, Jody, I'm going to have to have you on again. I always okay. say that, and I mean it. And I uh, it, 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 anytime. I mean, I you know, I love talking to you. I, I, I you know miss seeing you. Yeah. You know, and, and anytime because, like I said, I, I love. You know, I, I love talking about this kind of stuff. Oh, I love it. Well, I want to have a whole show dedicated to FEMA camps and the, and uh, Agenda 21, and I want a whole show dedicated to the dog man. And we're going to have to yep. work that out. For those of you listening, this is Mysteries of the Mind on Intrepid Radio. Please tune in in the future to listen more about our guest, Jody Cook. And until then, bye.